Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to today's episode of uh, Marvelous Medicine. Uh, the topic is age and reproduction. Here is Dr. Pandyan Natarajan. He's the chief consultant in andrology and reproductive sciences, Apollo 24-7 NOVA IVF fertility, and uh, Professor Emeritus of the Tamil Nadu Dr. MGR Medical University. Uh, Dr. Pandyan Natarajan did his MBBS, BG1, MD, Obstetrics and Gynecology from Madras Medical College and trained in infertility in UK under Professor Anne Jekker at the University Hospital, Nottingham. And he went on to do his postdoctoral fellowship in andrology and reproductive sciences and did his uh, andrological microsurgical training at the Clinical Research Center, North Peak Park Hospital, London, under Professor Green and Dr. Sherman Silver at St. Louis. The founder of the International Fertility Research Foundation, a not-for-profit organization that promotes research and an evidence-based management of infertility. Uh, Dr. Pandyan Natarajan is the retired professor and head of the Department of Reproductive Medicine at the Chetinad Super Specialty Hospital and the founder editor of the Chetinad Health City Medical Journal. Uh, Dr. Pandyan has published more than 50 papers in peer-reviewed journals, presented more than 300 papers in national and international conferences. He has given several interviews for uh, BBC Radio. He has many firsts to his credit, and his work is widely recognized nationally and internationally. He was recently uh, awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Tamil Nadu chapter of the Indian Fertility Society. Apart from all this, Dr. Pandyan Natarajan is a keen follower and a, a mentor for a Marvelous Medicine, and uh, we uh, look forward to your talk today, sir. Shall I begin? Uh, one minute. And uh, moderating the session will be Dr. P.M. Gopinath. He is the Director and Senior Consultant, Institute of Obstetrics and Gynecology and IVF at the SRM Institute of Medical Sciences, Chennai. Dr. Gopinath did his MBBS in from Kilpok Medical College and was a gold medalist in uh, MD Gynecology from Madras University. Uh, Dr. Gopinath did his specialty training in fertility preservation at uh, Sheba Medical Center, Israel. Also, a ASRM board certified andrologist and has done MBA in health services uh, management from Anna University. Dr. Gopinath worked in Madras Medical College for 30 years and retired as the director of the Kasturba Gandhi Hospital, Chennai. The past president of the Fertility Preservation Society of India and also of the Obstetrics and Gynecology Society of Southern India. He was also the founder president of the Society of Vaginal Surgeons of India and the founder secretary of Fertility Society of India, Tamil Nadu branch. Thank you so much, Dr. Gopinath, for accepting to moderate the session despite your busy schedule. I have a great pleasure in introducing my MBBS batchmate, Dr. Renuka Devi, the consultant in charge of fertility and assisted reproduction at GKNM Hospital, Coimbatore. Uh, Renuka did her MBBS and DGO from Jipma Pondicherry and is a member of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecology, UK. Trained in assisted reproduction at uh, Rotunda Hospital, Dublin, Ireland. Currently a DNB examiner and a research guide for postdoctoral fellows. She has presented uh, papers at several national and international conferences. Uh, Renuka is a good singer, a great hostess, and is a standing example of how to maintain work-life balance. Uh, thank you for uh, joining today's session. Renuka. Over to you, Dr. Patil Nathar. Namaste and good evening. During the course of the next 30 to 45 minutes, I'll try to give you an overview of the problem of age and reproduction. I must confess, I'm a man and there's no bias in my presentation or in my <coughs> practice in life. I have no sex or gender bias. Well, when we were all trained, we only knew of two sexes and there's a rare third sex. Now there are too many sexes and yet, I don't think we should discriminate on any grounds. And reproduction should be fundamental to every individual, regardless of their sex or gender orientation. I would like to state some biological facts as I see it. You may wonder why I make this statement as I see it, because many times my views seem to be contradictory to the popularly accepted view. I often see the half-empty bucket cup, and you all see the half-full cup or the contrary sometimes is also true. All life is connected in one way or another. I'm sure all of you agree with that. The previous population depends on the predator population. Therefore, life is connected in one way or another. 
And we also know for a fact that life begets life. Despite all our advances in science, we still cannot create life. All that we can do is create a different form of life. Even that's difficult. We can modify things, but not create new life. And this may offend some people. We are just two-legged animals. No matter how spiritual you are, how rich you are, despite biologically speaking, you're just a two-legged animal. We call ourselves Homo sapiens. I'm sure most of you know what this means. Homo is a species. species sapiens is specifically to us. There have been several homos before us, Homo neanderthals, Homo florensis, Homo donovans, all these people. All of them disappeared. Whether they disappear on their own or we finish them off, we don't know. History is very unsure about it. But for some reason, we coined ourselves as Homo sapiens. Sapiens means wise. We call ourselves wise human being. I do not know whether really we are wise. We are the only species who indulge in self-destruction. So how could we call ourselves Homo sapiens is beyond my imagination. That's pure hubris to call ourselves Homo sapiens. And this species is only 200 to 300,000 years old. And nothing has changed in that. Our biology has remained the same since ever we evolved from other homos. And biologically, we have not changed at all. There's no new model coming at least fairly soon. We often think we are on the top of the ladder. Evolution is not a ladder at all. And we are not on top of the ladder. Evolution is just a tree and we are just one branch of the tree. You may be surprised to know that our existence does not matter for the earth. All of the species would survive and grow. There may be some natural decline and death, but by and large, no other species would suffer if human being ceased to exist. So we need to take care of ourselves by taking proper measures and to reproduce, and therefore to understand that we are just one branch of the tree and not uh, the most important species, despite all the claims we make about it. And as far as the mammal is concerned, evolution seems to be a one-way street. There seems to be no point of return. They, the lizard may be able to grow its tail again, but we have no facility for that, except to have some amount of regeneration in some organs like liver. And also please remember, evolution is not by design. We often tend to believe that we evolved. We did not evolve. We are, are here because by default. Mutation is what drove evolution. And evolution is primarily by default and not by design. And the talk is about ageism or age. Ageism seems inevitable. We all believe that we all have to grow old. A lot of research going on preventing, postponing, delaying. But as science stands today, there's no way of denying it. Aging seems inevitable, but you can delay it, certainly. There are several measures attempt, being attempted. One important measure, time and again proven, is calorie restriction. Other method is relative hypoxia. A third attempt has been made with taurine. I mention this because delaying aging does not seem to influence reproduction. By postponing your date of death, you may live longer. But living longer does not improve your fertility, at least in women. Some more basic facts about human reproduction. I'm sure we discussed it a long time back in one of the meeting in December. Uh, thanks to Dr. Vidya, she sent me the video of it, so I don't want to repeat it. But we also talked about reproduction being a fundamental right. Most societies, most governments accept that. And I just want to re-emphasize, even today, most species reproduce by asexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction is a default in evolution. Nobody knows, a lot of theories as usual, why did we have two sexes at all? It would have been easier to have a single sex and goes on reproducing rather than having the complex mechanism as we see in human beings and in many mammals. Reproduction is a very complex phenomenon in all the so-called evolved species. It probably rose because of a default in evolution and not by design. I want to re-emphasize again, evolution is by default and not by design. Of course, we all know now sex and reproduction are completely delinked. It is possible to have sex without the risk of reproduction or be able to reproduce without the need for sex. Now the interesting 
confusion about is about menarche, menstruation, menopause, and the controversies around it. Again, we have a lot of theories about it. Why do girls have menarche? No the mammalian species has a clear menarche. There's a pubertal change, but not a specific menarche. And why do they menstruate? Month after month, a woman, average woman has 13 cycles in a year, and each has a blood loss of 80 ml. We're talking of one liter being lost every year. Does it help in any way? That's why we had a paper on that. We believe that menstruation is a biomarker of failed physiology and not physiology. And why do they go to menopause? Again, menopause, these are very peculiar human phenomena. So there are some claims that some chimpanzees do and some whales do. I'm not sure how well you can record those things in those wild animals. But basically, these things are not helping the woman as far as physiology goes. But menopause, is it helpful? In fact, I've had this uh, question raised on many forums. People are raising this question. People claim that nature is unkind to women by bringing in menopause. Uh, I think we have to debate this, whether it's unkind or it's kind. We probably can, uh, Vidya, can, can you put up the questions, Vidya, if possible? I forgot to tell you before. Is it possible to have the questions, poll questions now? Or is it uh, too late? Okay. Can you just quickly uh, go through the questions and give me an answer if you can? Can you all see the questions? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Last time when we had the poll, it gave me a lot of useful information. Uh, I had to understand that, okay, what is the response? So if you've all gone through it, I'll move on with my talk. Uh, give some time for completing. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Oh, can you continue the talk then? Or what yeah, do you recommend? Uh, yeah. Or is it going to obstruct the screen? Ah, yes, sir. Part of your screen won't be seen when the poll is going on. Okay, then let's, I'll wait for a minute. In fact, I forgot to ask you to do it in the beginning. Somehow it skipped my mind. It will take very little time. I finished it, so I think oh, people great, will great. finish in one or two minutes. Oh, you are an expert. You are a specialist. Radhakrishna, can we continue? I think a little more, a little more time, Vidya. Yeah. Okay, you, you just give the cue when to. We just keep talking. Start. So uh. there has been controversy about this. Everything menopause. They have a very interesting story or history. In fact, many science things are story to start with, then they become science if we can prove it. The story goes like that: menopause occurred because of the grandmother theory. The grandmother wants to look after the grandchildren, therefore they, she evolved into having menopause. Well, all these are stories like your Big Bang story. We don't have any proof for it. Why a woman had menopause or why she... What we know from biology is women never lived this long in yesteryears. Remember yeah. the Victorian era, the age of the life longevity was only 40 years in Victorian era in Britain. Women never lived this long. More and more women are living longer and therefore experience the menopause. This is how I look at it. Rather than saying that you not know, a grandmother story or a, or a whatever stories they're all. See, it's very straightforward. Uh, nature never meant it. Again, yes. menstruation is by default. Yes. Most of the animals resorb, they yes. reabsorb, they are not pregnant. But in the human being, there is a default or there is a mutation which prevents this reabsorption of the endometrium and therefore she sheds the endometrium if she's not pregnant. And remember, menstruation happens only if she's ovulating and not getting pregnant or if she's anovulatory. Anymore. Can we look into, sir? Can we look into the poll results? Oh, great, wonderful. Please, thank you very About, much. Sixty-five uh, percent of the um, viewers have participated. Wonderful. Our, the the percentage is increasing slowly. So when we look at the first question, is uh, is human fertility declining and infertility increasing? Uh, Ninety-three percent of them believe so. That okay. uh, human fertility. Yeah, wonderful news to me. Okay. I mean, is that news to you, sir? Is it contrary to well, your opinion? It is news to me because I, I, I mean, I'll explain to you when I come to that point, right? Because okay. I don't think this is the message being spread in all the newspapers and journals, magazines, everything. 
I didn't tell Julie why I disagree with that viewpoint. We'll come to it in a minute. Okay, then next one. Second question is uh, what, in your opinion, is the right age for a woman to have a child? Uh, when, uh, there are three options. One is uh, 20 to 28. Uh, the other one is 29 to 35. And the third one is about 35. A majority, 87% believe that the right age for a woman to have a child is 20 to 28. 3% believe about 35. Strangely, we need to know which three of those. And 10% think that it can be between 29 and 35. Great, great. So 87% believe that uh, 20 to 28 is the right age for a woman. And the right age for a man to have a child is slightly different. Uh, they believe, 67% believe that it should be 28 to 35 years as for a man. And uh, 20 to 28, about 27% believe so. And about 35, about 9%. Okay. So the the age group for men is slightly higher than that of women. How old is too old for a woman to have a baby? Most uh, participants believe 45 is too old. 31 percent believe that 35 is uh, too old. And there are good three percent. I, I presume is the same three percent from the other question that they believe that 25 itself is too old. Okay. Great. The next question is, how old is too old for a man to have a baby? Uh, for, I think between 45 and 55, uh, the opinion is more or the same. 47% of the participants believe that 45 is too old, whereas 41% believe 55 is too old. Whereas 13% uh, believe that 35 is too old. So majority believe that the man should be, uh, you know, uh, can be older. Now, the sixth question, the interesting question is, uh, is God, nature, unkind to women to induce menopause? Majority think that uh, it is not true. So, 78% no. no. said no, means they believe that God has been kind, nature has been kind to induce menopause in women. Whereas at 22%, it is interesting to see who these people are and what is their explanation. They believe that is unkind. So for the, every question, you know, there, there are some opponents. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And yeah. the last question. Do Seven men questions. undergo spermopause, male menopause, andropause? 66% uh, say yes, whereas 34% uh, say no. Okay, great. Can I just address these questions before we go on to further, so that I can know that they are going to change your mind or I have to learn more about these things. The first question is, is fertility declining? I think most people felt it's declining. Well, that's a conventional teaching. I will explain in a subsequent slide why I don't believe, and I'll show you some evidence for it. Then you can decide whether the evidence is convincing or not convincing. And the age of, uh, right age for, uh, again, is going to be in the talk. But I, I would agree with the 20 to 29, even probably younger than that also, if the law allows it. Same applies to men. I don't know why we have different ages for men and women. There's no reason why a man should have a child at a later age. I do not see the biological logic. Remember, this talk is purely a biological perspective, not a social perspective. And now old again for a woman to have a baby, we already discussed in the last meeting about uh, the ethical issues involved in it. Again, we'll discuss during the talk also. And about menopause being unkind. Yes, I'm glad for those few people who feel it's, uh, yes, it's unkind to a woman. I remember a lady at 70, if she didn't have menopause, getting pregnant, the few women who get pregnant, because of egg donation are also being condemned. And if she were more women were to get pregnant at 70 years or 60 years, it's going to be an enormous burden for her. That is why this has not happened. I didn't think if you all call nature or God as unkind, I would think it's not so. It, nature is kind. This is, I'm not only those three persons. There are a lot of scientists who go on that stage. I'm talking of uh, infertility perspective who say, God is unkind to women by bringing in a menopause. No, God is kind to, God or nature is kind to women by bringing in menopause. And men do not undergo spermopause, andropause. There's a condition called ADAM, androgen deficiency of the aging male. That is well recorded. But again, it doesn't happen in everybody. The testis does not shrink. Men go to grave with their spermatogenesis intact. Testosterone level is reasonably intact. There may be some decline because of other factors, but testicular function does not impair. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful feedback. Shall we move on? Can we keep the poll off? How do I stop the... No, uh, you can go ahead, sir. We are good to go. No, no, we, oh, okay. It's gone, right. Right. 
There is a trend. This is what I'm saying. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Is it possible? Let me just see if you can take a picture of it. Can, can you take a picture, Ravidya, and give it to me? This poll results. Uh, let me just try see if you can take a... Uh, uh, Radhakshna, you'll take a screenshot, right? Let me just learn how to do it. Uh, Radha Krishna will do it, please. I think I took one. Let me take the. That's very useful information. Radha Krishna, you will take the poll results of all the questions, right? You will uh, keep a record of it. Um, Just okay. flash something on the screen, so the rest of them. Right? Okay. Anyway, it will be on the video, sir, I think. Uh, okay. uh, uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I got the recording, yes. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The trend thank you. trends, what we see in literature is, there is a trend in female fertility showing a decline. See, this is the data from 50 onwards. 6.1 was the number of children per woman, and it gradually drops to... So looking at it, you, yes, fertility is declining. I'm sure everybody would be inclined to believe that fertility is declining. Well, I would be... I was inclined to believe that until I went into the greater detail. Now, again, if you look at this, you again see this is what's happening. From such high fertility, they started declining continuously. Declining even further. Let me just move my screen. You see that now? Now, 2.1 is a replacement fertility. But we have gone even below that. China went, introduced a one child policy. There's a huge drop. And now they're having only less than 2.1, and they're going through a demographic crisis. We'll hear this word again and again. And this is the worldwide trend. The fertility rate is declining everywhere. Fertility rate is declining. Portrait is not declining. This is this is a very important slide. This slide will summarize the whole thing. Why we have this misconception? Look at this slide very carefully, please. And look at this. Remember, as I mentioned before, a woman is fertile two years after menarche. She may be fertile at menarche also, but some women have irregular cycles to start with. But by one to two years, it stabilizes and she becomes fertile in two years' time, maximum. So thereafter, a fertility is there. If you look at this, if you look at this, there's hardly any change in the fertility for the last 27 years, this data. And this is the fertility of a woman at different age groups. Same is true of here. This is men. You see, again, there's hardly any change. So what happens now? We Now we have banned by law that women cannot get married before 18. And childbearing before 18 is very truly unknown. And people get married later in life and start at postpone having the first child or start attempting later. By then, the natural decline in fertility has started. And people don't want even to wait. Earlier, the definition of infertility was two years. Now we made it one year. And again, there's no strong reason. It's not evidence-based. So virtually, we push the graph, from the population we are screening, from here to here. With the result, even here in all these individual age groups, you find the increase in infertility or decline is gradual and not so marked. But when you cut off this population and have only this population, you find the infertility incidences increase. This is the most important reason why we claim infertility has increased. And why infertility is declining, we'll see in a minute. I want to re-emphasize this again and again because age is the single most important factor influencing fertility and infertility treatment also. There are other factors like overweight, obesity, just for a discussion another time. But many other things are familiar to all gynecologists and practitioners. We will not get into those things. Now, this is again a very important slide. You see that age is a crucial factor. Fertility starts one to two years after menarche. It starts declining from late 20s and from 30s. Some people say after 25 starts declining. There are no, there is no way of clearly putting it a number on it. Fertility is very low after 40 years. And after 40 years, it's very rare. There are anecdotal pregnancies, but you really can't give a percentage. Now, if you look at the figures in the early 20s, the incidence of infertility is one to two percent. 
textbooks will tell you 15%. 15% is a avail of all age groups. But late 20s, the incidence has gone up to 16%. And mid late 20s, 25%. And early 40s, it's more than 50%. And above 45 is rare to get a woman to get pregnant. This data again is from India. You see, but different data collection clearly indicate maximum fertility is around 20 years, 25 years. There is some sort of plateau there. And after 25 years, it starts declining. And it's virtually unknown. Pregnancy after 45 is very, very rare. And this is a data indicating that. And the, unfortunately, this awareness is not there even amongst doctors. We tend to believe wrongly that, okay, it doesn't matter. I'm only 25 years. I'm only 30 years. I'm only, no. 30 may be young for many other reasons, but not for fertility. By 30 years, your fertility started declining. The longer you delay consulting, the longer you delay having a definitive treatment, greater the risk of remaining infertile. That is why it's very important to seek guidance, at least the initial screening and guidance as early as possible. This awareness is not present even amongst practitioners, doctors, and many learned people. There are many reasons why people don't have baby early these days. The single most important factor is education. Well, as those days when contraception was the primary thing, focus, people say the best contraception is education. If you put the girl child in the school, the chance of getting pregnant is less. They do discontinue, some children do it, but by and large it's less. Next is career. These are two important factors which pose reason why women or girls postpone fertility. Of course, there are other reasons like participating in labor and market force. Wider availability of contraceptives. Today, contraceptives can be obtained from the over-the-counter. And of course, a lot of people want to establish financial stability, whatever that means. I don't know whether we are ever going to be financially stable, but there are a lot of people who say that I want to at least have a car to have well, a lot of claims and whatever they want. Another major problem has been nuclear families. Nuclear family is an invention of the 19th, late 19th and 20th century. Before that, when you say family, it's always a joint family. And this then started in the Western world, has now fought all over the world. And in a joint family, the grandparents take care of the children. The parents are reasonably free. Whereas in a nuclear family, the mother, the father, most of the time the mother has to do everything, and therefore she postpones having the first child. And of course, there are some women, some couple choose not to have a child at all, for whatever reason. And you see, again, educated women tend to postpone having a child. You look at the childbirth, motherhood is postponed. The more she's educated, the more she postpones having a child. And this is the single most important reason why you find fertility declining or number of children declining. Well, we can't beat biology. That's why I said we are a 300,000 year old species. Despite a few mutations here and there, we have not evolved further. We are living longer, longer than whatever 300 year old uh, homo sapiens, as you call it, was able to do it. Now we live much longer. And living 100 years is not unheard of nowadays. But yet, over here has not changed much. The follicular atresia continues unrelentlessly, unceasingly, continuously from the intrauterine stage of life. At 20 weeks, you have 67 million. By the time of birth, the female fee child has only one to two million. And at puberty, it has only three to four lakhs. And of these, only 300 to 400 ever mature and follic ovulation happens. At menopause, this woman has still has got 1,000 follicles. Probably for the research minded, they may think whether we can recover these 1,000 follicles from the ovary and do in vitro maturation. That's for a future thought for research. But as of now, at menopause, she has, though she has 1,000 follicles, she will not respond to the endogenous or exogenous gonadotrophin. And she cannot have a baby, a biological baby. There are exceptions. There are exceptions of postmenopausal pregnancies also, but there are again only exceptions, anecdotes, and not true pregnancy rate. Ovarian reserve also starts dropping continuously. It's maximal at birth. It's maximal at 20 weeks, but there is no way we can do anything about it. At birth, thereafter, the decline is continuous. That is why I said 25, 20, about 20 feet is arbitrary for social reasons. But after two years after menarche, she's ready to have children. And that's the time she has maximum fertility. And of course, ethnicity, race, all of them have an influence. 
And this drop, continuous drop, is primarily determined by genetics. Nutrition has a role to play. By the nutrition, you can't postpone. Nutrition can hasten uh, the loss of ovarian reserve. Ethnicity has been for a recent paper from one of our own colleagues has found that Spanish women have more ovarian reserve than Indian women. And you may wonder why the Indian population is growing. That's because primarily we all marry early and have children early, unlike the Spanish women. But by and large, this observation has been recorded several times that Indian women have less ovarian reserve than many Caucasian women. But all these changes happening in the ovary, strangely, the uterus does not seem to age at all. There are age-related changes in the ovary, but it doesn't go in for atrophy like what we describe in the ovary. Ovary cannot be stimulated anymore after menopause. Whereas a postmenopausal uterus can be prepared to have a baby, carry a baby, and to carry it to term also. That is why you find postmenopausal women having pregnant children. Age does not affect the uterus directly. The uterus acts as a carrier for the pregnancy. Uterine polyps, leomyoma, are more common, but if they are not there, then she can still carry a pregnancy. Even a postmenopausal woman and a prepubertal child, the uterus and the endometrium can be prepared to receive an embryo for implantation and development. All these slides decline. See how things have changed. More and more women are postponing having the first child. So the graph is showing that women at 35, 39 also having children. At 40, 44 also, these women have postponed having a child. That's the reason why fertility has declined, not because of real biological decline in fertility. Well, with the advent of donor gametes, egg freezing, now age seems to be no barrier at all. And this is an, again an illusion. You'll see in the next slide. You see the age. This is dropping earlier. Now we find uh, again an upsurge in older women having a children. There is a definite impact of delayed childbearing in the, on the woman and also on the child. There's, if she were to try at 38 years, she's got a longer time to achieve a pregnancy. Infertility is far more common. She has, a, because of the aged oocyte, greater risk of miscarriages. Ectopic pregnancies are more common. Multiple pregnancies, these are all published literature. Uh, this is the diabetes, mellitus, preeclampsia, other conditions. The question is, how old is too old? Which we debated in the last meeting also about how old is too old. This is difficult to give a specific age. Remember, calling a woman as 40 years old is based on a data which is pretty old. Now, women easily live up to 80 years. So why would she have another 40 years of life? Why should he deny her having children? Her chance of biological fatherhood, motherhood is difficult when you encourage her or at least support her having with donor eggs. Why should we stand in her way? If she decides to have a donor egg and a motherhood, I don't think we should integrate with that. But again, there are, if she were to have her own child, or her, own, her own eggs, you must explain to her counselor that she has a higher risk of having babies with chromosomal anomalies. Both Down syndrome and other chromosomal anomalies are far more common in women as they age. And of course, even if she were to get pregnant, her chance of having a live birth is pretty low. Is as low as 2.7 percent when she's 45 years. So this decline is inevitable. It's primarily related to the age and not the environment as has been portrayed. Delayed childbirth also increases the need for ART. In fact, you find most populations ART is far more commonly used in people who are 30 and above, 35 and above. At this age, spontaneous pregnancy is rare, but even at this age, a study reproduction. Thus, is not a panacea. It's not a magic band. Even with that, the quality and quantity of oocyte decrease. It's a chance of low ovarian respirator, failed fertilization, and the pregnancies have their own problems. So we must accept the reality that ester reproduction is not going to change the scenario drastically. But more and more women are choosing ester reproduction. In many places, you see in this graph, it's forming as a woman ages, ester reproduction forms an important component an important method of attempting a pregnancy. Across all demographic groups, this is what's happening. You find more and women are resorting to estrogen reproduction because time is not on their side. We looked into our own department data, thanks to Dr. Povitra and Dr. Sobarnika, and they gave me this data about when women are less than 35 years, our pregnancy rate was 30.4%. In the 35 years and above, it dropped. This is despite having an embryo transfer. 
Many women tend to believe that having an embryo transfer is going to achieve a pregnancy. No. Even after embryo transfer, the pregnancy rate is only 18.6%. Of course, and of course, there are many problems with the children also. When they start, when women start attempting having a baby, women has diabetes mellitus, she can have problems, children can have problems. Many times, most ERT pregnancies end up with cesarean sections and the children have to spend some time Then they, they lose the biome, microbiome. I just want to make sure I don't too much, take too much time. And they have other problems like uh, motor neuron skills, all those things. Younger mothers, now this is the question, I asked the question, how young is too young to have a baby? Two younger mothers also have problems in pregnancy and in childbirth. But unfortunately, this data again is skewed because when you talk of young teenage pregnancy, we're talking of people who are unwed mothers, talking of mothers who are, are abandoned or malnourished. We don't have any data on well-nourished young women who are teenagers. So this data is clearly indicating that teenage mothers have a problem with the babies. The offsprings are low at, at birth weight and preterm birth is more common. But nevertheless, as things stand today, I think teenage pregnancies, particularly when she's alone, is going to be a problem. So we should encourage pregnancies, maybe the late teenage or early 20s. And as somebody rightly said, 20 to 25 is probably the optimum age for a woman to have a child. Having a pregnancy early because of the other problems, new undernourishment, lack of antenatal care, she can have many problems. And this is the uh, list of all those problems. Well, again, is nature kind or unkind to a man? I don't have the answer for that. Women tend to, again, uh, like for when Sildenafil pill came, people, a lot of people question, why only a pill for a man? Why not for a woman? Unfortunately, our biology is different. Men and women are not the same. Equity is only in social contexts. In biological contexts, it is not so. There is no dynamics of age and procreation in men is different. Age threshold for biological fatherhood is not definable. Seven parameters, though there have been claims it declines with age, there is no clear data on that. And if there is a decline, it is not as evident as in women. And when women are able to have children and don't feel bad about it at all, in fact, they feel like heroes for doing that, the only difference in men, older women, some older men, primarily because of other associated medical problems, and the drugs they take can have altered sexual function, sexual dysfunction and infrequent coitus. That can lead to reduced fertility. But per se, the seven parameters do not change drastically. And again, the claim about increased chromosome anomalies have not all been proven. Even a recent paper just a week back said they did a study of the embryos and did not find man's age influencing the aneuploidy or the chromosomal anomalies in the embryos. Well, these are just some men who are had children at age of 90, recorded proven, 84, 96, 92. And there may be many more, and this, these children were not born abnormal. Of course, this if you take those, do not make the final report, but suffice to say that there is no evidence that it is the same gross problem, gross problem, but nevertheless, it's good for them to have children early. There are other problems listed in literature. I have not faced these things at all, so I will not be able to comment on that. Well, a new dimension has come in the last decade. We were freezing egg, we were freezing sperm, primarily to prevent gonadal damage by chemotherapy. Chemotherapy, as you all know, is advanced for, given for malignancies, and often sometimes even for tonic tissue disorders. And they are going to toxic. So it was offered, if they are married woman, she was offered to have an embryo freezing. This is a single man or a single woman. We were offering sperm freezing or egg freezing. In 2013, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine said it is not experimental. Until then, it was considered to be experimental. The techniques have got very standardized now, a very uh, good recovery rate. We get as much as 90 to 95 recovery rate for the sperm for the, and for the egg. So we find that it is not experimental anymore. And that opened the floodgates for egg freezing. So women were told that you don't have to worry about aging. You can achieve reproductive immortality by having your eggs frozen at 30 years. You can choose to have a baby whenever you want. And why do women postpone having a child? But two reasons are, are reported. One is 
She has not found Mr. Fit yet. I don't know if there's any Mr. Fit at all. If there's one, I like to know from him what are the features of a Mr. Fit. Second is, she is still want to establish a career. To me, a career is a rainbow. You keep chasing it, you want more and more. If you are the president, you want to have another term. If you, are the, you have two terms, you don't know what to do with it, you have no choice. But by and large, everybody is pursuing a rainbow. So unfortunately, biology is not caught up with all our ambitions. So are we creating a dangerous delusion or are we really helping this woman? Again, it's for you to tell me what it is. So we have to counsel this woman that postponing having a child by having the egg frozen is a possibility. But she needs to have at least 20 eggs frozen to have a realistic chance of achieving a pregnancy with that. And having egg frozen does not automatically translate to pregnancy. You have to have IVF done and have it transferred. And there are always limitations of fertilization, growth, and transfer and not holding. All these issues are there. So there are again risks of a woman at 40 having a pregnancy, at 50 having a pregnancy. So are we really encouraging? Are we exploiting? I, I don't know the answer for it. But what is happening in the Western world is egg freezing parties are very common. Egg freezing educational seminars are common for the lay people. And is, would there be epigenetic changes by long-term freezing? I think Dr. Bhutra's PhD should give us an answer about it. She is freezing the sperm for long term and seeing if there's going to be any change in the DNA fragmentation. And what are the rights of the children born through these procedures? There are many social issues. Postponing having a child is not simply a woman's choice. It is her choice, no doubt. Nobody can interfere with that. But it is not a demographic problem. Postponing is leading to a demographic crisis. 124 countries are now going through a situation where they don't have replacement fertility. Remember, in the 70s, we were told India is going to bust. Now, India is supplying manpower and woman power or human power all over the world. The Indian diaspora is the largest in the world now. They are influential. And remember, a child is, I'm not for or against, I'm just telling you the reality. A child is not born with just a mouth alone. A child is born with two legs and two feet, two arms. It's going to be a workforce. And that's what's happening now. And many countries are having a huge problem because working population is going down, older population is going up. And this is going to cause a huge problem. Well, again, women have been told that you can't have both. Many women have proven, I think many women in the audience and many women you all know, come look around, you see that many women are beautifully combined being a professional and a mother. But one word of caution, you can't be again like a perfect fit, a perfect man. You can't be a perfect mother, the perfect doctor, whatever that means. It is not possible. Perfect remote is the enemy of the good. The more you try to take your child for every possible extracurricular activity, it's going to cost you your time and you're going to burn out. So you can be a good doctor and a good mother. And as this woman beautifully shows it, remove this lady who's working a manual labor, he managed to carry a baby and still she's working. If she had a choice, she would not do it, true. But she's still not going to give up on that. She's doing it. And there are many, many women who have beautifully managed to do both. And there's a beautiful paper in MedPage today. It says about, you can be, don't believe, don't tell, if anybody tells you that, no, no, you have to do only one, no. You can do both, but you have to make compromises, undoubtedly. And there's no harm in making compromises. Remember, our birth is a compromise. A mother had to make a lot of compromises for you to be born. Well, these are the women who have been condemned for, with no justification for having a child, saying that they are selfish. These women are not selfish. These old mothers are not selfish. They chose to have a child either for their own biological need or their family's need, and they chose to have it. One woman of this people, many people died, and that has become a poster issue. And even this woman who died, she said, I have no regrets. That's not matter me at all. I'm glad I had a baby. Though the doctor never warned me about the risk. Well, I think at 70 years, she must have been warned. If that's the wrong thing which the doctor didn't do. But by and large, she still feels that she has no regrets about it. Well, let me conclude by saying that time and tide waits for no man, woman, and I think you have to figure out this LGBTQIA. It stands for lesbian, gay, 
bisexual, transsexual, cure, indeterminate, and asexual. Infertility is a race against time, as is fertility. So we must emphasize to the patients and to the public, have the children as early as possible and seek treatment as early as possible than delaying it. Let me summarize by saying that fertility and infertility are age-related conditions, primarily in women. There may be a questionable age-related decline in fertility in men. As the reproduction is unable to overcome, it does help. Definitely, chance of getting pregnant is more with assisted reproduction than trying naturally, but you don't expect the same results as in a younger woman. And as I often say, assisted reproduction is most successful in women who least requires it. Pregnancy and assisted reproduction has its own problem. Unassisted conception, medically unassisted conception in young age, the best reproductive outcome. The old saying, Parvate Paisai, cultivate at the right season is the most appropriate problem for age and reproduction. The pendulum keeps swinging. This is a beautiful slide that Dr. Pushra made. And Dr. Radha has been giving me a lot of interpretation. I leave it to your imagination to interpret the way you want it. She said these are children whose parents have died because they had children at a very old age. And this mother is affected with hemiplegia and the child is feeding. And this is the problem of older mother. She is a person who works for younger age. And she looks at this as a happy family where the children are all young and the parents are young. Well, I will let me conclude by saying that yes, anything, everything is better when you're young. There's no doubt about all. The question is how young is too young. And most of you may be shocked to know that the decline as far as fertility is concerned starts in late 20s. And therefore, the earlier the better. Maybe as Radhakshana put nicely, 20 to 25 is probably the best age. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Pandian. Good morning. Welcome. How are you? Thank you very much. It was an excellent talk covering almost all the aspects. Let me just begin the first question. As an healthcare provider, what will be our message to the woman to be a mother? We know the age, we know the decline, we know the ovarian reserve, but in general, what do we tell them? Do we frighten them? Do we tell them, no, you go your way? Or do you say that, what, what should be your message? That is a very important question. I think the question I would like to pose is, we have interview or counseling or, or everything. Before somebody joins the MBBS, there's a counseling. Before he joins it, we don't have pre-pregnancy counseling, unfortunately. And you should start in, in the college. You should tell the people this, this career is important. Yeah, but remember, career alone is not important. You also, if you want to have a child, there are women who choose not to have a child, different matter. So what I would tell them is, Try to have children as early as possible, trying to combine both. You want to finish your undergraduation, that's fine. And finish your undergraduation, have children, then go in for. And there are men, a lot of lot of daughter and families who say that they encourage a woman to study after getting married, after having children. There's so many women like that. So I think I would tell that we need to counsel them. Do not postpone having a child for too long. Again, how long is too long? This is, again, these are very difficult questions. <laughs> they, each one each one has got their own family circumstances. But I would say, yes, have the children, basic education in undergraduation. After undergraduation, time to have children, finish your family, pursue your post-graduation, pursue your PhD, go for your career prospect bottom ends. That's my recommendation. But it's on the record. contrary, you will see some of the corporates, multinationals, they pay for uh, egg freezing in order to make sure that they have maximum work time and they probably tilt the work-life balance by just encouraging them to just support and go for a oocyte freezing in them. What is your take on that? In fact, when this was introduced, uh, in, I think 2015, and we were in Manipal, we have a meeting and we were discussing. They all said, oh, it's so nice of these corporate people. We are so concerned with the woman. I said, I have a long view. I think they are not concerned with the woman. They are working concerned with the workforce. They want these women not to go and have a baby and take leave. So they want to encourage these women to have egg freezing. No, I would tell them, look, egg freezing is all right for women undergoing chemotherapy, but postponing having a child because you're working 
And I would not recommend biologically. Yes, yeah, the final decision is a woman's. Biologically speaking, no, don't postpone having a child. And if I don't find a Mr. Fit, I don't. That's a very question, difficult question to answer. Uh, I've not still found a Mr. Fit. Is there any, you are to give six, yeah? I don't know if you got it, but by and large, I think the most important message is have, get married. I mean, even saying married today becomes difficult because have children as early as you can do it with proviso, with your career, with your education, all that is being included in it without postponing too long. And this egg freezing is not a panacea. It's a lot of problems. And we do not even know the ovarian reserve. And when she has only five eggs and six eggs, what do we do? So I think that's not the panacea at all. Thank you, Thank Dr. Pandey. Thank you, Dr. Pandey. And that was an excellent um, talk. I think you took us through the whole process of aging and reproduction and the whole lot. Now, um, I was in a conference last uh, week uh, in Bangalore and uh, people, age and reproduction, we know how with age the reproduction declines. But a lot of people in the conference now, the talk that is going on is about ovarian aging and not your chronological aging and reproduction. It's about ovarian aging and reproduction. So you see women in their 80, 18s, early 20s and all coming to you. I'm sure you see that on a day-to-day -day basis, which was not seen earlier. 10 years ago or 15 years ago, we saw high FSH and you know low AMHs in probably one or two cases in a month. But now we see that every day, you know, we see. So what is your consensus on this? Is Do we need to bring in some kind of a screening uh, test that will determine what your fertility is, something like a fertility screening test so that you can act on it and maybe put it out there in the population to screen your fertility because people, a lot of people are talking about AMH being used as a fertility test and, uh, you know, yeah. doing that in uh, awareness about AMH in colleges and other workplaces. So what is your consensus on this, Dr. Patel? Well, that's an excellent point you raised. Should we screen? Whom should we screen? Everybody after the teenage or should we screen people who are married and want to postpone children? And screening ovarian reserve does not equate to infertility. All the tests are clearly proved. AMH does not mean that the woman is not. Ovarian reserve only tells you how many antral follicles are there, whether it's okay. AMH or FSH. Yeah, a woman has got, let's say, a low AMH, does not preclude a pregnancy. On the contrary, it causes a lot of concern. I have low AMH. Should we counsel them? You have a high risk of going in for uh, premature ovarian failure. It does not correlate. And remember, a ovarian reserve started only after ART. Only thing ovarian reserve tells you is number of eggs you can get out of this woman. Nothing more than that. Ovarian reserve does not correlate with pregnancy rate, nor with miscarriage rate, nor with the live birth rate. It only tells you this woman is likely to, not likely to have 20 oocytes or 10 oocytes. Her ovarian reserve is low. AMH is only whatever it is, and uh, well, not AFC, likely to have anything at all. You know, it's yeah, just no, not have yeah. AMH is very low, and uh, yeah. yes. But again, the problem is it's like people are talking about varicocele in earlier years. Should we screen all men for varicocele? No, I have this problem. I'm bringing this point because a doctor couple came to me and said, "My son has got a varicocele. He's an unmarried boy. He's a medical student." I said, "Why did you look for it?" They said, as routine test, routine test, why don't go look for it? We had an abdominal scan, and then also they had a scan for the thing, and they found a varicocele. And most urologists will swear varicocele will, over time, reduce the sperm count. I had to have the courage or the foolishness to tell them, please ignore it. There are only two things you can do when you have that. Either do a sperm test for an unmarried boy, and again, sperm test has got a lot of variation, and then you should keep repeating it. Or you should get married, produce children. I said, ignore it. There is no proof varicocele causes infertility. This is my opinion, right? Same is true of ovarian reserve. Ovarian reserve, in fact, this is a debate which is just going on. Ovarian reserve, reserve does not equate to early menopause also. Yeah. So, this yeah. Woman, so why, why should we do it? I don't think, I only feel this test will cause more concern. Well, if she's going to get married, yes, you could do a pre-pregnancy counseling. At that time, yes. But if you start screening all teenagers for ovarian reserve, she maybe may not, be, maybe not all teenagers, maybe in their twenties, mid mid twenties and early thirties. Planning married or unmarried woman or 
married i'm okay married and not postponing a child married and postponing a child or not postponing, postponing a child yeah. postponing a child is a conscious decision that i think we should encourage that's what i'm saying any woman who is consciously postponing a child let's say for example they come to you for contraception you must tell them before you go for contraception let's see how you are and this has happened to me with men people have been using contraception when they come to attempt a fertility they are asexual and this man has been using a condom for what purpose and that is very true if a woman comes to you for contraception to discuss you will say yes let's see what's your fertility But before we do on a ocp or whatever thing but screening every woman who comes to you at 20 years for gynecological thing i think will cause more harm than good because if you find a low afc the low amh what are you going to do can you do anything about it are you going to ask her to get married and actually like endometriosis what do you do when you diagnose endometriosis early is there anything you can do about it except to prescribe pregnancy that is the problem so i see your point but i don't know whether screening would cause more harm than good or it will be really good for the patient to me i think let sleeping dog sleep let's not go and wake it up and pass over yeah leave it alone for the time being this is planning a pregnancy yes yes sorry very good i i totally agree with you on that pandey so in case if you are doing going to do something with the screening with an aim and you should have, have an answer when you don't have an answer for the test there is no necessity to do the test on a general population and a routine screening for example if you as you said it is the right population which requires screening then we can just do that but on a general basis since we don't have an answer whether a low amh is not associated with the pregnancy whether low amh is got an increase in risk of miscarriages we really don't know the facts as of today so since we don't have a facts you know it's not worthwhile just doing a general screening so uh, can I, if i can just interrupt here suppose a, a woman is uh, uh, consciously planning to postpone pregnancy uh, but uh, is not yet um, taken the final decision w- would any of the screening tests help her to uh, make a more informed decision so she might choose to not uh, is there something which can tell her that it's better not to postpone uh, you have already told that it's better not to postpone for everybody i am not talking about that especially for her yeah, yes. is there something that you have you can offer yes. which will help her make a better decision uh, about postponing pregnancy yes that's what, what dr renika said that's yes. most appropriate patient screening for ovarian reserve is the most appropriate thing for a woman who wants to postpone having a baby you can tell her look i did a ovarian screening and your amh is so much afc is so much you seems to be reasonably okay so you have no problem in postponing it but again postponing does not mean indefinitely you must tell them look every cycle you are losing more oocytes it doesn't true. mean you tomorrow not to want maybe a year or two doesn't matter if she comes at 25 and says i want to postpone for another 2 or 3 years you can counsel her yes you are in the bright age to have a baby but for a reason you want to postpone fine go ahead i've done a screening amh is fine afc is fine and go ahead and start to there's no there is t- ovarian reserve testing which is reasonably okay for short term but again doesn't tell you the quality it only tells you the quantity quality is not definable by amh or afc dr vani you have your camera on yeah, you say I, yeah i just want to say hello to gopi i already said hello to pandian it was nice to see both of them and this has been my passion and nobody listens to me so just like when you do ultrasound and you say because of pndt act we can't tell sex in india i think every infertility clinic every gynecology clinic should have one you know slogan saying the best age for fertility is 20 to 28 because people i remember i mean uh, an actress saying that i am ready to have a cricket team at 36 and i was getting mad how is she ready to have a cricket team at 36 that is because she had frozen her ovary uh, uh, embryo so everyone knows about freezing oocytes about amh like nobody goes to a doctor these days they do lft complete hemogram etc etc they'll just add amh to the panel i just want to say that this is my passion and thank you pandian we need to increase awareness and very mm-hmm. cynically i would say nobody will listen to us thank you for that l- lovely lecture thank you thank you um aveli you have your camera on did you want to say something no you're muted you're muted if you wanted to say something go ahead otherwise uh, dr radha you, you you have a 
Dr. Pandian repeatedly mentioned that you participated in getting this uh, presentation ready. Would you like to say something, Dr. Radha? <laughs> nice to see you all. It, uh, I enjoyed listening to all of that because we have been, uh, the, all of us, the, the first front slide, Uvitras, over Nikami, all of us have been in the journey with him for so long. Anyway, this is the moral of the story. The last slide, I, which I really admired, it was a swinging of the pendulum. So that is my message to everyone because it's, I know it is very hard being a professional to manage career and uh, motherhood. You need support, a lot of support. That I think should be the emphasis. Staying nuclear is not going to help. We need every person possible to help us to raise our children as well as to take part in profession. That's the only thing which I would advise to all my colleagues and patients. So postponing doesn't help. So having a support definitely helps. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vidya and everyone, and uh, Dr. Gopi, Dr. Rajkushu, Bagdi, Vani, There's so many of the friends I saw. So I'm so happy. Uh, Povitra, do you have something to add as a younger, uh, as a next generation person compared to uh, Dr. Na Pandian and Dr. Gopinath? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, I think so. Hi. Nice to see Dr. Pandian and Radha. All the best to them. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thanks uh, for uh, inviting me to say a few words. Uh, I always, I don't consider me as the present generation most of the times because I go with the uh, uh, views of the previous generation, actually. So I also uh, hope I'm audible, ma'am. Hope I'm audible? Yes. 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 We yeah. can't see you, though. So we can't hear you. Uh, uh, Sorry, ma'am. I'm in the car, so I can just. Never mind. Never mind. Then go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, you can. Yes, ma'am. So at uh, this, um, uh, what the thing is, I agree. Like we put these slides together, so I agree with whatever. I think you're having some problem with your connection. Perhaps after you. Uh, uh, also, you... because I think that uh, that is not helping them in any way. So we go with the antral follicle count only to counsel them how many oocytes we will be able to retrieve. I don't think it helps more than that. So screening AMS, again, I'm not for that. And age, of course, the earlier, it is better, ma'am. And I think all of us, actually, most, most of us would be able to balance. There are exceptions everywhere in everything. So I think at least as doctors, we should not push women you know, to go for social oocyte freezing because the corporate companies as such would only tell them what will be the, you know, pregnancy rates. Okay, you're, you can get pregnant even at 35, your oocytes will be 25 years old. But they don't tell them that she's getting older and what the antenatal complications that can happen at an older age. As I think as doctors, we are supposed to explain that to the patient even before, you know, like as we say, we are actually helping them, but most of the times we don't help them. Uh, so we are supposed to explain to them all the consequences and then let them take their decision now. So these and are my views. If they really want to help, they should say that, yes, we give you at least a year of maternity leave and you can come back yes. to your whole job. That nobody's yes, willing yes, to I do. Think that is, <laughs> no, ma'am. Uh, but uh, I think most, ma'am, my, my mom got married when she was doing her undergraduation. She was 19 years old and she gave birth to two kids. She finished her post-graduation also. And uh, she's been take, she took, to, took care of us, two of us as uh, like, because my mom, my father was a marine engineer and she took care of two of us as a single mother. So I think, I think it is, we'll be able to balance it most of the times, ma'am. Yes, sometimes as exceptions, like they say, post-graduation program, you're not supposed to get pregnant. There are such problems, but most of the times we'll be able to balance. So, uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, I, I think as long as people are allowed to take time off and come back and finish, uh, but uh, both sides, there are people want to not, uh, you know, not come to work, but also finish on time. That's where the conflict comes. If if you, if, if you get pregnant during your post-graduation, say, I'm taking a year off, I come back and do my second year and third year afterwards, uh, so half the problem will be solved. Instead of that, uh, most of the people seem to think that they should finish the, with the same three years, but in the middle of that, a pregnancy and, uh, you know, everything should happen. So I think yes, there should be given take from both sides. Uh, give and take from both sides. And I think many of them have handled that also, ma'am. I've seen a lot of pregnant doctors who work, handle their, pre their pregnancy really well, who've, uh, who've delivered kids. Still, doctors do not have a break right now. I don't think doctors <laughs> take a maternity leave of three months or six months, but I've seen them handle things beautifully. So I, I think a balance is, is possible. Most of the times a balance is possible if we can do it now.
um, uh, there's one point that I like to make with yeah, there is uh, by delaying pregnancy, most of there is a group of people who think by delaying pregnancy, IVF is the answer to all this age related problem, which is not the case. We all know that IVF is not the answer to delaying a pregnancy because age is one of the biggest determinant of any success in IVF. So that point mm -hmm. has to be, you know, uh, yeah. definitely people have to be made uh, aware of this point that, uh, you know, you have to be realistic, whether it's natural pregnancy or it is an IVF pregnancy, it's going to be the same thing, age related problem. Vidya, can we have the poll again, if in case there's going to be a change of mind or? Dr. Pandey. Yeah. Radha Krishna, can we do the poll again? Yeah. Yes, please. Somebody. Oh, I, I need to check whether, uh, yeah, I'll try. Okay. Uh, Dr. Bandi, please go ahead. Namaste, Dr. Pandi. No, you were saying adolescent varicocele, because as pediatric surgeons, no, we are also in the dilemma whether to do the varicocelectomy or not. So, what, what is the sort of you know, real advice? I always get confused when it comes to okay. ending it. Yeah, I'm glad you raised this issue. Then the poll is on again for the, anybody who wants to participate, please. Uh, namaste, Bhakti. I'm glad to meet you. Uh, varicocele was considered to be the cause of infertility in 1953 when we had no standardization of anything, virtually nothing. Cement analysis was not standardized, fertility concern. Then thereafter, it just got per, you know, the indication why the varicocele caused infertility was they said increased total temperature. That was the norm earlier. When that was ruled out, then they said adrenal cortical metabolites keep coming behind. I don't know how adrenal cortical metabolites will come into the testis to produce a problem. Even that is gone now. Now they say DNA fragmentation. And time and again, many studies have clearly proven varicocele is not the cause of infertility by both observation and by semen analysis. So I would not recommend a child to have a varicocele unless the child has got pain. And pain is very unlikely to be a very major symptom. Yeah. Most of the time, it can be pain. All it requires is scrotal support. Mm -hmm. Scrotal support rather than the boxer shot, you have to have a, a panties kind of shot. Beyond that, surgery for varicocele, I do not recommend for fertility. I'm very clear about it. Despite I've done them in the past. I've done them in the past. And then I realized that I'm not doing them any help at all. I'm on the contrary, I'm postponing them having a baby. Therefore, I don't recommend even for an adolescent adult or anybody, except if there is a symptomatic varicocele, severe pain, which is very unlikely. If you see them, it's a different matter. Not for infertility. So the literature also says the same today, is it? For infertility, yes. don't have to yes. go Yes, now, see, the problem is these guidelines are a political statement. In the sense, you know, one person can tilt the balance, the influential person. They are not committing now. In properly selected cases, you may consider, this is the word, same word, you may consider. What is properly selected? Who, why we may consider who is the person? With ART coming in, I think it becomes totally irrelevant. Okay. If the couple have been married long enough, take them for assisted reproduction. Or if the salmon sample is good enough, do an intrauterine insemination. And now do a varicose selectomy, wait for one year for the salmon parameters to improve. By then the woman has got one year older, her oocyte reserve is going down. So I would recommend not doing a varicose selectomy for fertility issues. And European Urology Association, they all are on cat on the wall. I think it'll take some time, see, for them to give a drastic statement saying that don't do. But NICE is very clear. The National Institute of Clinical Excellence, UK, very clear. It says don't do. In fact, their statement is don't do a varicoselectomy because it has proven that it does not improve fertility. And NICE is a government body. It has no axe to grind. So it is clear. The recommendation is they have got a different recommendation. Red signal amber signal and green signal. This is a red signal. Don't do varicocelectomy for fertility. That is very clear about. Good, thank so, you, sir. Uh, Dr. Gopinath has to leave for another meeting. Sir, would you like to say uh, your closing comments, sir, Dr. Gopinath? I think Can you ask him to answer, uh, the, uh, answer the poll before he goes? Could be? <laughs> no, just to see if it... Yeah. Finally, it is a very good overview on the age and uh, fertility issues, where to start, where to stop, when to stop, how to stop, you know, uh, what to screen and what not to screen. And this is a, we, there is a lot of practical messages. I think it will be very useful for the people to follow up. 
Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Is fertility declining? Infertility increasing, Gopi? You want to answer that? Um, uh, definitely it is not declining. But the thing is, there is an increase in awareness. There is an increase in just going in for the thing. Previously, they used to wait for seven years and come to us. Today, they come to us for seven months. Excellent. Correct. I, uh, that's what I also feel. There is no evidence of declining fertility or increasing infertility. Okay. So the rest of the poll results uh, look more or less the same. Okay, great. People Regarding are not changing the, mind about fertility decrease yeah. and because they said yeah. infertility, fertility is declining and infertility is increasing is what they said in the initial phase. Have they not changed their mind yet? I'm not convinced. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> is it is uh, is more or less the same actually here? Seventy-eight percent still believe that there is a decline, but then I'm surprised that after your lectures, uh, still twenty-two percent believe that. Uh, uh, the fertility remains the same. There's, there's no decline. I don't know. Maybe they added the male gender to it. Okay. Okay. Anyway, wonderful. Thanks, Raj Ratakshana. That was great. And your your summary of the meeting in Facebook was phenomenal. <laughs> I was really, really. I mean, it's such a beautiful way you put it all together in that ten lines or twelve lines or whatever it is saying about the meet today's meeting. That's really great. About aged fathers attempting to have a baby. But that's under gunpoint, sir. Vidya puts in, <laughs> says, write something in the mind that I didn't do it. Now, the, the, the interesting uh, aspects of today's talk actually is a wonderful talk, I should say. And uh, there are many, many new things I've learned. And as you rightly put it, most doctors don't know these, these things. I, I didn't know that uh, men's fertility doesn't change uh, as compared to. Uh, uh, woman and then I'm also surprised to see that uh, you know the the girls will have ovarian failures but men don't have testicular failure they are not on par yeah. why, why does that happen because what is the etiology of girls developing ovarian failure and men not developing testicular failure or their nutrition their obesity their uh, actually the boys tend to have more bad habits than girls they just don't yeah. have menstruation. <laughs> 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 As the menstruation is, is, is taxation on the ovary. Yes, um, they use your eggs has, every month. So, but as the the lay the when you take a lady, they have a finite number of eggs, so yeah. they keep on just sort of now for every ovulation, there are at least fifty to sixty oocytes are being lost. So whereas and whatever is the antral follicle which is there at the time of the second arrest of the second meiotic division there remains the same number. Whereas if you take the male, there is a continuous process of spermatogenesis every 60 to 72 days. So that is the difference. Why there is a delay? Now, okay. Can I just yeah. add to it? Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, we, we, biology never thought we lived this long. Nobody lived this long. If you look at the paleontology's history and then you look at the ancient man, 300 years when back when 300,000 years when we have formed initially, we lived for 25 years, 30 years. In Victorian era, we lived only for 40 years. And men were who die much before. They will fight, they will die. And women died in childbirth. So menopause is a recent phenomenon and therefore nature, and as I told you, nature is not by design. Nature is by default. There is no provision in nature for that. So now maybe if evolution, maybe thousand and ten thousand years i don't know how long the time frame for that if it were to happen maybe women have postponed menopause we don't know and why men have it because men never leave this long and there's no design and men have spermatogenesis going on because as gopi beautifully said the sper spermatozoa the spermatogonium the stem cells keep dividing whereas in women all that whereas animals don't go for menopause because they die much before that they don't leave to 100 years and menopause also 60 years now most animals are dead before they are, because they have to hunt to get the prey. So this is the reason I look at it biologically because both of them would have dead long time before they reach the old age when physical function. Maybe if women live, men live to 150 years, they may have the testes get undergoing atrophy. I don't know. It's only a hypothesis. So another thing is, uh, 
uh, the the truth that the best fertility is the age of 20 why is it not known to the world why is it not in billboards why is it not written on the buses and why is it not in the hospital in my hospital there's not even one banner says 20 is the best age uh, for pregnancy why mother-in-laws do not know why mothers do not know this i mean who failed he why we failed why why, why? why? good question good question we we, we have to educate people but advani failed Every everybody, all of us as professionals fail because our emphasis has been too much on the population explosion. See, in fact, when I came back to India in '87 and went to the government to start a department in government general hospital, I was an assistant professor there. The health secretary told me, "Doctor, you want to talk about infertility in an overpopulated country?" He didn't even understand that infertility and fertility are two sides of the same coin. I said, "These people are desperate. They are." Even today, unfortunately, they don't have a reproductive medicine department in Tamil Nadu government, as far as I know. I'm not talking about an IVF program. I don't think they have it here. And this is now 87, I came back and tried to start one. So I think at all levels, starting from the minister, the health secretary, the DME, our level in education, and our public, we have to educate the public. Why? Even in USA, 30% of the oncologists only advocate for fertility preservation. For women undergoing. Why? Awareness Patta, is there. But... Yeah, Patta, yes. can I answer you? Yeah, yeah, Men yeah. with all bad habits have, uh, you know, azospermia. It's not that they don't have failure. That's also failure. That is there. And all mothers and mother-in-laws know the correct time of fertility. Enough fertility in their time. But the educated girls are not aware. That's why I said we have to have in every clinic and nobody will listen. Maybe some activism is required. That's why I found I'm not good in activism. That's why I was very excited to listen to Pandya. Now, the, the another point I want to emphasize on Dr. Pandian is put up questionnaire uh, with uh, equal emphasis on men and their fertility. What is the significance? Do, I don't think men seem to play any role in uh, your talk at all, sir. In, in other words, uh, why did you put what is the ideal age for a man to be, uh, you know, have a child and, and so on? What is because the a couple, before Pandian answers, it's that an is, infertile couple. That's a social thing, is talking about up. social thing. That's a good question. See, I put this question because there are a lot of claims saying that even for a man, age matters in having a baby. That has not been strongly proven by any data. I mean, there are claims and counterclaims. Every recent data, and this a week back, a paper published saying that they analyzed the embryos. And even above men above 40, their embryos were not having more abnormalities. So I, I think why men are not subjected to this problem is Biologically speaking, the woman's oocytes are all formed when she was inside the uterus, her mother's uterus. And since then, there's a gradual decline. And these oocytes are exposed. We think they're inside the womb. Remember, inside the mother's womb also, the child is exposed to environment, the mother's food, mother's habit. The environment also affects. So there's a continuous decline. That is why an aged woman has a poor quality oocyte because this oocyte has been exposed for the last 35 years. Whereas a man is producing fresh. He has got only the stem cell, like the liver regenerates. He is producing sperm continuously from existing stem cells, not the original cells. That is the reason why men can go on producing and there's no data, clear data indicating man's age matters for fertility. Whereas a woman's age matters because the oocyte, which is going to form a baby at 38 years, was formed when the woman was inside her mother's womb. That is why we now feel these effects are transgenerational. Food, environmental exposure are not limited to one generation. What you you are not what you eat, you are what your mother ate, and what your grandmother ate. So all this matters. Same is true of environmental exposure. That is why you say earlier the better. How early is a difficult question. Teenage we rule out because government doesn't allow before 18. And let's so she also has to educate, maybe some minimum education, at least under graduation. So as you rightly put it, 20 to 25 is probably the best age. And we need to educate everybody. And as Dr. Pujra said, we need to have a balance. People will. There is a compromise. Undoubtedly, you have inevitable. Compromise is inevitable in life. So we have to tell them, look, you have to carry on adjusting both sides and have a child and also manage a career to the extent possible. That's what I look at it. 
Dr. Pandey, man and age probably in terms of fertility is not correlating, but would you believe that male infertility is on the increase? No, I don't. In fact, we did a data in our own department. I'll tell anybody to go back and look at the data. If you're going to base a man's fertility based on WHO criteria 2021, look at your data and you find that it is not what the textbooks say. Textbooks will tell you 30, 30, 30 for balancing purposes and 10% is unexplained. And then they'll say 40, 40, all kind of with the first, now these numbers are wrong because you never get such a round figure at all. You're just trying to do sort of getting consensus. And if you go, we did into a figure. And remember we are a tertiary referral center. We went into the figure very carefully and found that the incidence of male in is much less than what has been reported in literature. Everybody is talking about it. Everybody is talking about male yeah. infertility on the rise. If you look at your data, if you look at if you if you accept WHO criteria and look at your data, you will not find that at all. On the contrary, you find what is in fact our data clearly indicated the maximum. If you look at the category is unexplained. I'll, I'll just tell you from of my memory, we found twenty percent is male infertility, something like thirty percent is female infertility, and 40% is or 50% is unexplained infertility. Or combined, maybe 10 is combined, both had a problem. This is because we were going by again. You know, if you go start looking, you find you are quoting a previous data, previous data, like 15%. What is the incident of infertility? 15%. What age you're talking about? What is the incident of anything that has to be age related? All health concern. This is the problem. People claim that male infertility is increasing. No, I'm not convinced male infertility is increasing. As Gopi said, People are reporting more often. And we are diagnosing more often because of wrong criteria. If you go by WHO, in your own department, you look at your data, use the previous data and present data, you find, in fact, we found a drastic drop. All you go as you know, Zeus per yeah, maybe it's another occasion I will. Drastically dropped from 37% to 3%. What has happened? Are men getting more fertile? No. Our definition is like everything else. Diabetes is increasing. Yes, it's increasing. No doubt at all. Obesity is increasing. But our definition of diabetes also is increasing. It was 120 before. Now we brought it to 100. Now it's, 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 hypertension is increasing. Yes, we are, we are obese. We are stressed. But also our definition is changing. Because we are bringing the criteria. 120, 70 is the normal. Then more people will be included. This is the problem. It means infertility as well as male infertility is concerned. Though the claim is male infertility is increasing. In fact, the great scare story stories going around the world is man's when sperm count is <laughs> in the next so many years man is not going to be producing at all that is the scare that's, that's a scary and headlines all over the world man's fertility is declining continuously sperm count is declined from 90 million to 60 million remember if you do a sperm test in your own department ask two people to do the sperm test i can assure you each one will give a different number and on two and different days, it is going to be different. Two different days, same person, two different technicians will give two different values. These are not reproducible at all. These are scare stories because they eat their If I will tell you, like, man, fertility is not increasing, man's fertility is not declining as evidence is available, then you are in the bad book or you are not creating a sensation. And it's a damn squid. It's not sensation. No evidence. And I'm not convinced a man's fertility is declining, though we are doing many things wrong. We are smoking, we are drinking. Environment is polluted, all that is true, but there is some account of protective mechanism preventing us from having a decline in fertility and comparing Scandinavian data to this data and that data. I think it's the wrong thing. And no two technicians give the same number. How are you going to compare a sperm test done in 1960 to 2020? Methods have changed. They never had a macular counter in 1960. So you had a no bar counter and you're using dilution, so many errors there. So these are not a correct way of comparing at all. And to say that it is reduced is all nice headline story, but they're not the reality, in my opinion. Uh, Dr. Padma wants to know why uh, counts are decreasing with each generation. I mean, is it true that it's happening or and, and not why? Why is it so? No, I'm not convinced that the sperm concentration is decreasing with each generation. That's the tall claim which many big, big people. This is what I'm saying. I am uh, I try to quote this one, like, I keep quoting, I like this quote, this is true. Nobel laureates go on stage and say, look, Nobel laureate went on stage and said, look, when IVF was done by Bob Edwards, you are creating a Frankenstein monster. 
<laughs> like big man told, like big man told, in, there is no more male infertility. Because when Nixie came, they said, you can take a single sperm and inject. Where is the question of male infertility? And when they started recovering, we were one of the early people to recover sperm from testes. They said, no more male infertility. If there's the age of sperm, go to the testes and recover. Testicular sperm recovery is only 50% of the best of hands. 50% of the maximum. Our results were 40%. That means 50% of you can't do anything at all unless we become in vitro spermatogenesis or cloning. So these are tall claims, headline news, but reality is infertility is with us. It will be with us. The longer you delay, greater the chance of infertility, poorer the fertility. And uh, uh, the claim that infertility is increasing, not enough evidence for it. Main because sperm count is declining. I'm not convinced about the data available. So I am one of the outliers. <laughs> The, another question from DDT from Apollo. Uh, what is the effect of regular contraception in a regularly sexually active female on fertility? Regular contraception in a sexually active female on fertility, does it have any effect? Now, there is a claim that post molar contraception, after that, after a post after a post contraception, some degree of input is there, not proven. Maybe first few cycles. If she's been on oral contraceptive pill, the first few cycles are going to be anovulated because anovulated. she has been suppressing it. IUCDs in some women can produce intrauterine infection and tubal problems. I mean, you can't say nothing is 100% safe. You can't say the fertility is the same, but no marked decline in fertility with any available contraceptive methods, either in men or in women. Men you use only condom. Others are all still experimental. Renuka, would you like to have a daughter-in-law of 20 and insist she becomes pregnant at 2021? 20, no. She has right. a mind. She has a mind of her own, I suppose. <laughs> no, no. My daughter-in-law will have a mind of her own. I don't have to dictate terms. <laughs> no, but um, she should know. A good mother-in-law. <laughs> vote her away in reserve if that helps. But no. no uh, Dabdwani, uh, do you think uh, girls should get married while they are interns and become pregnant before they start their PG? Can you unmute uh, Dr. Vani? No, we can't hear you. You try. Uh, Patta, mm -hmm. I'm not advocating that, but I usually tell the girls, do your PG or uh, PhD along with pregnancy. Somewhere, I mean, nobody, and uh, I'm a mother-in-law and nobody's going to listen to gynecologist mother-in-law. So I don't have Renuka as a mother-in-law yet. <laughs> the trouble <laughs> is nobody listens. Full stop. Nobody listens. I'm being sounding cynical, but nobody <laughs> listens. So I'm so relieved to hear Pandian. And you put in your clinic, Patta, at least. <laughs> no, unfortunately, <laughs> in my specialty, I can't talk with these things to my patients. They, they think, uh, you know, I'm just crossing the line. And of course, as you see, and you're the right people for non gyne non-fertility specialists. We can't broach this subject at all. And, you know, uh, people don't like... Uh, uh, us talking about those. No, we just have to increase awareness to the girls. Yes. Like so many people don't want children. So many things are there. But they should be told that fertility declines. That awareness is not there in the young girls or they don't listen. They only going for egg freezing. They don't know of egg freezing. So, I mean, I've been trying this, but like I said, I'm cynical. No one listens to me. So I gave up, but Pandian didn't give up. That's what I admire. The Kaveri, you had something to say? He can unmute. Unmute, unmute. Can you give me a wonderful discussion? I joined halfway through. Yeah, Lovely to see you, Renika. Nice to see you, Lovely Patasa, see you and a nice discussion by Dr. Pandian. All I want to say is, you can you can reproduce at any time. Up to 35 is a fine age. I had my child, a test tube baby, at 38 because I got married at 36. My son was born be a blastocyst only because the sperm counts were less. So he was a blastocyst child and he's wonderful. He's just like any other child. Uh, only thing is, parenting will become a difficult issue as the age increases. 
so reproduction should be at any age convenient to you because people wanted to have a career they wanted to go for higher education some wanted to make uh, money and things like that they have to look after many things and uh, therefore uh, with the with the changing times we have to change what is the issue is as you say the sperm uh, the oocyte becomes a little aged one in some people but uh, it is not in all you can have a normal baby at 38 at 40 also the point is how to bring up you become aged and you cannot run after your child at 40 be it the women or the man even the man has a age he cannot run at 44 and 45 behind a toddler so therefore you have to have a child between my point is between 28 to 35 any time being doctors all of will be doing pgs up to 28 or 30 settle into a career why not why not you be happy thank you thank you uh, age is not a big thing for us. our profession up to 35 is fine you can even do it as mani madam said do your phd and get it pregnant also because i uh, find uh, uh, this is the practical thing only point is parent do see having a baby is also for a happy parenthood the parent who becomes a little difficult because you have to run but for me it is making me young I run, run behind my child at 16. I'm having a college going who is an intern at three now. My son is fine. He's 23 and doing his internship. Thank you. Thank you. Another thing I wanted to say is screening procedures are not adequate in India. Uh, we also had a discussion with a partnership of doing some uh, screening procedures for unusual diseases like uh, muscular tendons, uh, dystrophy, and all those. So uh, globally, there are about twenty thousand cases every year. Means in India, it is about two thousand five hundred. So that's an alarming figure rising. Therefore, we should have some increase in the screening procedures in India, which is not existing. So that part of it is important. And as uh, uh, Bani Madam said, the age between twenty to twenty-five, we have to tell the, we have to create awareness. In the youngsters, because they are taking it as a see this extra marital relationships is becoming a very uh, what is a very common among our college girls. Uh, so what happens is they go for MTPs, and the MTPs are done in a uh, what to say it, it's not really uh, it's not openly done right. So they when they go for a secrecy, there is some some issues. and it goes in for pid and this uh, tubic tubal block and uh, problems in their first pregnancy so a lot of tubal pregnancies are there therefore i think we have to create an awareness in college girls either you go for a early pregnancy or you use a proper contraception or uh, better better you have a single partner and be loyal and get married you have to create that uh, fear in them that mtp is the biggest nonsense that is happening in india because it is liberalized and people take it for uh, thanks granted. thanks kaveri uh, there are other done secretly most often and they go in for pid uh, ravi shankar you want to say something yeah i just wanted to say that it's uh, it was a fantastic talk um i i i personally believe that uh that male fertility is decreasing i think the uh lines of evidence are pretty clear that not not just sperm count but sperm quality goes down but it doesn't affect reproduction to the point that female decreases in female fertility result in uh you know problems with reproduction but again i'm i like these policy decisions but having a child is such a deeply personal decision like uh, renuka said everybody has to have a mind of their own i don't think having a child should be a default option but it should be by design uh, and you know understanding what goes into it the 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 pros and cons of doing it early versus late all of that is something that the individual has to decide and today both society and medicine are at a place where we can support either one of those you know if 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 a if a if an older woman wants to conceive she has options which weren't there many years ago 
So I, I personally think that these are all amazing advances and that they help us become, I think, better parents. I don't agree that older parents are not as involved with children as the younger parents are, um, because I think younger parents are more distracted than older parents. <laughs> older parents are definitely way more involved with their children. So, I mean, and, and you know what? All of us, at least me certainly would qualify as an older parent, but I don't think I was any less of a parent because of that. But then again, that's a personal thing. It doesn't mean that every older parent behaves the same way. The bottom line is, I think that these are all wonderful advances, great um, in, you know, pieces of information to have. I mean, we keep telling people, don't smoke, you're gonna get cancer. It's gonna kill you. It hasn't stopped people from smoking. You still see them do it. So just because you tell a, uh, a girl that, hey, you need to have a child quickly, otherwise you will have problems conceiving, and she's not gonna do it because you never realize that it's gonna happen to you. So yeah, people with increasing awareness, but I think the best thing is to provide options. Thanks, thanks Ravi. Uh, Renita, you have any, anything to say about Ravi? Yeah, there's a doctor, Padma Priya, who said that, why don't you advocate adoption instead of IVF to the older couple? Um, I think she asked that question there, Dr. Padma Priya. Yeah, she did, yes. Yes. Um, I think as IVF specialists, we are uh, totally focused into, you know, uh, okay, you don't have eggs, you go for donor eggs or, you know, do something like that. But uh, we, as IVF specialists, we should also be advocates of adoption. That is my take on that. When you tell patients, go for donor oocyte, I think in the same breath, you should also be mentioning about adoption. Donor is something that I am not very fond of. Maybe that is my personal opinion. But if you say donor, when, when I was working in Dublin, when a patient came to I, for an IVF counseling, all the options were laid to her by the counselor. Now, what happens when your IVF doesn't work for you? What, how are you going to deal with it? Have you considered adoption as, a, as an alternative? I think these things should be introduced in our practice. And we, as IVF specialists, should definitely become advocates of adoption. We should have the information about, about, about adoption in your center. We have. We have it in GKNM. Uh, if the patient is not, we know all this go, uh, goes on online. So we, if the patient is not able to fill it online, we help them to go into online and register for IVF, uh, register for adoption while they're going through a process of IVF as well. You know, in case these things don't work, at least they're queue. They, they are there in the queue. You know, they, they'll probably get something. You know, they will... Uh, succeed with at least adoption. So I think, yes, Padma Priya, I would totally agree with you that adoption should be mentioned to the patient. It is their call. And at the end of the day, it is their call. But they should be, uh, you know, the, the they should be educated about it, adoption, definitely. That is my take on that. Dr. Pandian, what would you say about yeah, this? I totally agree with you. I agree with you and Dr. Padma Priya, yes. In fact, when we finish our consultation after all the evaluation, what we tell them is, you have three options. Yes. Accept the child free state, have a child free state, enjoy your life and carry on. Or think of adoption. Or your option is go for IVF with, with donor yeah. eggs or the donor sperm or whatever. The final decision is the patient, but whatever decision they make, we have to help them make the decision because they should understand the pros and cons of everything. Each, like yeah. that IVF is not a guarantee that they must understand. They tend to think that you're spending two lakh rupees, they're going to have a baby. IVF is not a guarantee at any age. More so when you are elderly. The chance the age, ART does not obviate the age related decline at all. And about Ravi Shankar's comment about awareness, yes. See, the incidence of smoking is coming down in all the Western world. It's awareness. Awareness is very, very important. What they will do, there's still people are smoking in the Western world, but the incidence has come down drastically. We were all, on one time, we allowed smoking in the aircraft. I remember the first time I traveled. They have a section for smokers. Can you believe it? In the aircraft, section for smokers. Most of you may not know that. You have young. it in labor wards. <laughs> they yes, have yes. it in labor wards <laughs> in, in the UK and Ireland. <laughs> what are we, what are we, we have to first educate and tell them, no, this is a hospital. You cannot smoke here. Simple. It is an aircraft. For, for those few 10, 20, 30, 50 people, you allow the others to. And how can it be sealed? Mm -hmm. Somebody said smoking section, your smoke comes to the other section also. These are ridiculous things, but we have to keep on doing it unceasingly, unrelentlessly, keep creating awareness, and things are changing. I am a fail hard 
optimist. Mm -hmm. I'm a diehard optimist. I do believe that you keep telling. This is what happens with every field. You keep on driving home the point that awareness of fertility awareness, smoking awareness, smoking is harmful, alcohol is harmful. You keep saying that. All claims are made, alcohol, one peg is okay, two peg is okay, no. Every drop is poison. You keep saying that, people may get offended with saying that. It happens to me many times. When a meeting, somebody suddenly called me to come and give a few words. There's a meeting on alcohol and health. The vice chancellor said, oh, one or two pegs is okay. I had to talk next, I said, no. One, every drop is bad. And this is not something what I'm saying. WHO has now said, there is no safe dose for alcohol. Alcohol is a carcinogen. What more do you require? This is the problem. We try to compromise. We try to be friendly. No. I think you make a scientific statement without offending. It's not to offend anybody. The fact that smoking is bad, alcohol is bad. Postponing having a child is not good for your fertility. You may have a child at 45. There are women who got pregnant at 45 years. You know, natural pregnancy, but very rare. Your, your odds are against you. That's all we need to tell them. Final decision is the patient. So on that note, I thought uh, we had a very wonderful hundred. Thank you so minutes. much, Radha. And uh, sir, your lectures all uh, always been enlightening, and each lecture has got so much uh, material and so much so many messages. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, the wonderful evening. Thanks, Renuka. Thanks for being there, and thanks everyone. Uh, and uh, we'll meet again uh, next Thursday at another episode of Marvelous Medicine. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. You are doing a phenomenal job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Phenomenal job. Thank you. And I think coordinating, putting things together is really great. Thank you very much Thanks. for Thank taking me as part of it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Radha Krishna. Bye-bye. <laughs> <And> Vidya. <laughs> Thanks.